Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Let's get your attention. I don't quite have a gavel yet, but hopefully, <laughs> as we yeah, go into our next Use your session, shoe. we may bestow upon me the official gavel. So, uh, welcome, everyone, to the May 4th, 2023 Board of Regents Committee meetings. We are going live in Zoom and over YouTube. My name is Lisa Kiyohokaloli Shower, and I am pleased to welcome everyone. The Regents will now convene the Executive and Governance Committee. I am sad to say that our current board chair, Marty Dickinson, is um, away in Europe in Italy, enjoying a wonderful trip. Actually, I think she's with yeah. other coops, and according to her social media feed, she looks like she's um, not having a good time at all. Um, <laughs> I will say she has stayed in close contact, and um, I have heard from her occasionally, and I wouldn't put it past her to be uh, tuning in right now. So uh, we appreciate her support. And um, as we move into this next section, I will admit it is a little awkward for me to be introducing the uh, next item on the agenda, which is the election of officers. Uh, myself, <laughs> the incoming potential chair of the WSU Board of Regents, uh, which would be much easier for her to introduce as opposed to myself, but uh, we are where we are. So uh, this one and only topic is the election of officers for this committee meeting. Um, I will share that we had a pretty robust conversation at the last a meeting, which was around kind of the terms of the election of officers. And we discussed the idea of a one or two year term for the board chair. And I think we had a really good conversation. Um, some of what was discussed was relative to each of our board terms. And those board terms are really defined by our governor who appoints each of us. Um, and so we serve at the pleasure of the governor, uh, not at the pleasure of our president. And so um, much to probably your, <laughs> um, maybe approval or disapproval, but regardless, uh, those terms are set. And um, there are some complications with us choosing a one or a two year term for chair, because right now our terms are um, vice chair, chair and past chair. And so currently we're running our executive committee where the vice chair, the chair, and the immediate past chair all serve for a series of years together. And so Marty and Brett and I have been able to serve the three of us kind of in um, that executive committee role uh, for a series of six years now. And um, it's allowed me the opportunity to really kind of shadow Brett's leadership, Marty's leadership, to feel much more prepared uh, to hopefully step into this, this new role as chair. So what I really wanted to do was kind of close the loop on that conversation and just say that what you're seeing in this action item that we hope to take action on tomorrow is a reflection on the opportunity for us to reelect uh, the chair position for another year, but not a bylaws change. So what um, is being suggested is that if there is a desire by the board to make a bylaws change, we need a little bit more time to do that. So I'd like for us to be able to uh, think about what the implications of that are. So when you say yes to chair, you're saying yes to, if we make that bylaws change, a six-year commitment, which we may or may not be able to do given uh, your uh, term and a reappointment with the governor. I don't think it's something that's not accomplishable, but we just have to look at kind of the terms and our appointment cycle. So just to be really clear, um, the action item for tomorrow does not reflect the conversation, which I felt like we had reached consensus that we had wanted to reflect a two year term for the chair. And the reason is there wasn't enough time to make a bylaws change. And it's a little complicated. Um, if we are interested in doing that, we need to take some time to determine how to make that bylaws change. So just wanted to make sure folks understood 
Can I just get you to clarify, Lisa, do we need to make a bylaws change to re-elect the current people for another term, or is that something we can just do? That you could just do. I believe it's something we can bylaws. just do. I'm comfortable, Crystal, I'm comfortable with the consensus position. I expect someone to serve two years without the bylaws change. We just, that gives that person the option to life's change. Only serve to one year. I'm, I'm comfortable with that with, with everyone else. And by the way, past chair is a really good year. <laughs> <laughs> I can give it up, but, <laughs> but no, it's not so, um, that was a piece that I think is included <clears throat> in this conversation. So I wanted to kind of follow up on that. The second element that um, we hadn't spent a lot of time discussing was the vice chair. And uh, the executive committee has spent some time, so that executive committee, Brett, Marty, and I, um, talking to each of you uh, about the role of vice chair. And very pleased that Jeanette has said yes to that role. Um, we've also talked to Regent Serna about his interest in serving um, in a vice chair and chair. And so um, I'm hoping that Regent Ramos steps into this role and that soon after Regent Serna also follows in the role. So um, I'd like to be able to kind of talk about as we start to think about kind of succession planning that we are actively talking and thinking through um, what that looks like. And so I'd love to see uh, Regent Shetler and Regent Redman um, take a, a role here. Um, also want to honor and respect the um, professional commitments we all have outside of this boardroom. And so at this moment, um, I think that uh, given where each of us are, and some of us have already played um, a role here at this table, um, uh, it seems like this is a, a really great opportunity um, for Regent Ramos to step into this role, and then soon after, Regent Serna. Um, and so I am really excited to be able to advance this motion um, for Regent Ramos to step into the vice chair role and um, which is open up the conversation. Just wanted to kind of close the loop on both of those elements, both the bylaws discussion that we had and then um, the election of our vice chair. That, any questions, comments, thoughts? I just want to say I fully support Regent Ramos moving into the vice chair role, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> here, here. Yes. Excellent choice. It's a great honor to be considered, and I uh, have considered it with, you know, great uh, seriousness because of capacity, and I want to be able to provide quality support to WSU, and so I'm super excited. I'm all in, and I'm all in for whatever the terms and time commitment will be, so uh, just fortunate to be very flexible. Um, but thank you for considering the motion. It's wonderful to see everyone bring their unique skill set. And you bring one as well. So thank you. Well, well, I appreciate the transparency of the context because, um, you know, it has been a really inclusive process and a, ver a very respectful process. And we talked about the timing and it's been very collegial. So I just, uh, appreciate the transparency. Lisa, I'd like to um, just sort of suggest that we that sort of pursue the transition to two-year terms um, because I really think that um, having been in the chair position before, you know, you sort of get to the end of the first year and you're, you're you know, you're sort of going strong and then, then you're out. So, and while you keep past chairs, it's, it's a different type of role and I just think it would be good for our board. And I think it's also a best practice. We had the chair um, across the country, had the chair serving more than one year. 100%, I would agree. Okay. 
action at this point tomorrow. Any other comments or feedback? I just want to comment on Regent Ramos tired today. That shows leadership right there. Is, uh, I looked at mine this morning and I said, man, that may be a bridge too far today. Next <laughs> Regents meeting, I'm breaking it down. I got a red one. That, yeah. You know, you can see from a ways away. Let's just Asian Pacific Island. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this is a big moment. So. Perfect. Yeah. WSU Cougar head pants. Yeah. Oh, that would look <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes, shot that one down really quick. Wait, doesn't she doesn't she jump a chip though? <laughs> I don't know if you have to listen to her anymore. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, thank you for the support. Uh, I think this is a really important part of what we do, and uh, I think. Um, I agree, this was a, a really inclusive process and the conversations leading up to this and the strategy and the thinking through um, the terms and um, was really a big part of what it uh, does has helped us do and ensure that we're in alignment with uh, the governor's schedule of our terms and appointments. And I, I really appreciate all of your help and support. So thank you. All right. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, conclude the Executive and Governance Committee and uh, turn over the gavel that I don't have uh, to the Strategic and Operational Excellence Committee. But before I do that, I actually um, really want to welcome our uh, Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration. I believe this is your first official Regent meeting, um, Leslie Brunelli, and it will be a incredible meeting because we have several hours this afternoon <laughs> of a finance and administration meeting. So welcome, Leslie. We're glad to have you part of the team. So let's welcome Leslie. Great, okay, and with that, Regent Shetler. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Board of Regents Strategic and Operational Excellence Committee meeting, and also remind everyone that we are live over at YouTube. Um, our first up, we have a information item and Provost Office Last Year Reflections and Current Horizons by Executive Vice President and Provost and Pullman Chancellor Elizabeth Chilton. Elizabeth? Yes, Kyle. I'm fine. I'm yes. where, where can you be seen as yeah. the Zoom? That's where yeah. you can be situated wherever. Okay, we'll great. Get you the clicker. <laughs> the first PowerPoint of the day. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, so the last couple of years, I, I took the opportunity to just give an update from academic affairs across the system um, once a year at one of these regents meetings. And so this will be a short update and I'm happy to talk with any of you about any of these and items and you probably know about some of these. Um, so first of all, I wanted to give you some leadership updates uh, from the academic affairs perspective. Um, some of you in the room actually serve as members of uh, the advisory board for the Ruckels Health Center, um, but we did a national search this year to find a new director of the center, and it was really an opportunity to elevate nationally the reputation. We got a stellar group of candidates. Um, the, the committee was chaired, the search committee was chaired by Laura Reiner Hill in my office, and um, Jody Sancourt, uh, Dean of Public Policy at UW, because it's a joint center um, that we administer, but it's a, it's a uh, public-private partnership, you might say, and that we are the fiscal agent. Well, a lot of the projects are really to serve the state of Washington. So Julia Carboni was hired as the next, next director. Um, she comes to us as an associate professor at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Uh, but she's being brought in as a tenured full professor, which means that uh, this is the first time I believe that a tenured professor will be uh, the director of the Ruckelshaus Center. It just gives 
stability and stature to the center. And we're really excited that she decided to join us. Um, also, Mary Rizak, Dean Mary Rizak, who many of you know, um, she, we uh, renewed her uh, five-year contract extension. And, and when we do that, we do a comprehensive review. Very, you know, obviously Mary has had uh, quite a few substantial impacts on the college and the university. Um, improvements to student recruitment and retention efforts. Um, we have seen uh, funding and publications increase for the faculty under her tenure. And of course, you all know that she was instrumental in securing the funding for the new Schweitzer Engineering Hall, beginning with a $20 million gift from Edmund and Bayet uh, Schweitzer and Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, which when you hear about the, the uh, Chris Mulix update, we also have some, some state match for that as well. Um, two other Dean uh, announcements. Many of you probably already heard that Mike Trevison, after a 10 year term as, as Dean of the College of Education has decided to step back from that. Uh, and we will be doing a national search in the coming year. So he will serve all the way through August of 2024. It sounds like a long time from now, but it will go very quickly. Um, and he has had a great distinguished service for the past 10 years and is really committed to helping us ensure strong leadership for the college moving forward. And then most recently, which he is coming out on Insider today, um, Dean Ship Hunter is leaving us for Temple University for uh, a deanship of the College of Business there. And Chip has served for eight years as the Dean of the Carson College of Business. Um, I think he was really just looking for the next opportunity um, and to be nearer to family in the Northeast. Um, I have appointed senior but, um, associate dean Debbie Campo by unanimous nomination. Um, you know, I've also talked to Scott Carson, who expressed his sincere support for the college going forward. And I know that we're in good hands. I met with all of the deans and directors, sorry, chairs and directors yesterday to let them know, and they showed great enthusiasm for Debbie. We will do a national search for that deanship, um, but since Chip is leaving us in July, we needed to have a steady hand uh, throughout that process. So that search probably will not initiate until about a year from now to give us time to really assess what the needs are for the leadership in the college. It's in really, really great shape, um, and they're doing amazing things, and so we wanna make sure that we keep that momentum going. So a couple of the things that we've been doing in academic affairs, particularly in the provost office, um, in collaboration with the deans and the chancellors and PCAs across the system. Um, two years ago, we established something called Core to Career. As you all know, our UCOR is our general education requirement. Um, and students often take those classes like a checkbox. You know, we've got to fill two from column A, one from column B and they're trying to get to their major. And one of the things that we found is that if you can teach career ready skills in the general education in their first two years, that gives them broader preparedness for whatever they decide to go on in after graduation. Um, some statistics show that only about 20 to 25% of students actually go on in a field in which they major as an undergraduate, which is an important statistic to really let sink in because we think of the bachelor's degree as preparation for a career, but in fact, it may not be a straight line connection between what one majors in and what one ends up doing in first job, second job, tenth job. And so what we're trying to do is teach career ready skills in regardless of whether it's in the major. And so what we've done is train our faculty. We, we did, uh, this is the second year of its existence. And we bring faculty in and we teach them the schools, the language, the theoretical framework, um, to intentionally teach career re readiness in these lower division large classes. So it's not career readiness just in your discipline, but in regardless of what you, what you go through. So, so far it's only in its second year, but we're seeing uh, great feedback from the students and faculty love it because it's not just, um, doesn't feel like just a technical preparation for a specific this uh, field, but feels like broad career readiness that I think our students want and need, and the public is asking higher ed to deliver. So more on that, we will keep trying to scale it up and reach more students. I think we've reached 
almost 10,000 students in the two years because of the numbers of faculty. I think we have 120 faculty teaching these large section classes. Um, over the past year, you have all seen uh, across the agendas in this meeting, um, the extension of academic programming, uh, for example, the Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, we, we extended that to WSU Vancouver, Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Media, we extended that to the global campus, uh, PhD in Biomedical Sciences, jointly with the University of Nairobi, those are things that, that we're in the process of developing that, that you should see soon. And anticipated new degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in Biological Education, one in Cybersecurity, which you learned about, Bachelor of Science of Pharmaceutical and Medical Sciences, um, Master of Energy Conscious Construction, and a Master of Veterinary and uh, Anatomic Pathology. Those are all uh, anticipated new degrees that we're working on, both with the faculty center and the faculty of colleges. And then finally, I just put a bullet there. We had a deeper dive into the faculty salary equity process that we explored this year. Um, that was very successful and will prove useful as we continue to make headway on faculty salaries and equity in particular in the, in the year and years to come. You have all heard about the uh, faculty cluster hire and the scholarship of racism and social inequality in the Americas. And we have done four rounds of this uh, so far since 2020. First year, we focused on just broad scholarship, get people's creative juices going in how they could approach this topic from their particular discipline. Um, that brought in five tenure track faculty across our system, multiple campuses, multiple colleges. Second year, we focused on health inequities and health justice, similar, another five. Uh, third year, this year, uh, we're completing hires on Native American and indigenous communities. And then for next year, we have just selected a group of uh, four departments to move forward with hires for food and environmental justice. And so each year the idea is to have a theme so that we're building cohorts of scholars who are mentoring each other, mentoring us. And it's be, the, what we've done now is the selection for this year included faculty who were brought in the previous two years. So that they're providing us input on how we can expand the scholarship. The idea is not only to increase the diversity of our faculty, but also the curriculum, the diversity of our research um, portfolio, um, our students, because this has shown very useful as you diversify the faculty, you are providing role models for our students, increases student success. Um, so, you know, we are really at the beginning of this, but our commitment is to continue this in perpetuity. <laughs> until Kirk tells me to stop. And um, I think it's, it's really shown some, some great uh, forward progress in our goals for the system. Um, this was the first year that Tremaine Gaither, uh, special assistant to the provost, um, initiated our participation in the National Day of Racial Healing. And this was a system-wide initiative with uh, a number of days, uh, a, a number of events across the system. I'm just looking at my notes here. There were hundreds of people who participated in lectures, in focus discussions, in film, uh, joint film watching, in Zoom meetings. Um, and this was the first, uh, first time that we did this, although I told Tremaine the first annual, and hopefully we will continue to participate in this every year. It's January 17th this year, um, uh, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. Day, to make sure everybody was, was back uh, and in place. Uh, one of the things that we did in tandem was a mental health virtual support space. Um, and it was a 20 minute teleconsultant with counselors and Cooper Health Services to any student across the WSU system who wanted to reflect on anything that they wanted to talk about. Um, but, you know, with a focus on destigmatizing de mental health services, um, you know, racial healing is not the same thing as focusing on other movements that have uh, addressed issues of racism, but really focusing on the healing process and the mental health processes that support that. Um, so those were some of the highlights there, some of the big ones, and I'm happy to take any questions either now or offline. I have one. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any questions? Yeah, just in terms of the cluster hires, I know um, that part of why we uh, wanted to to 
use that program was because there's been good data from other institutions. This is a good way to to um, to diversify our faculty and to to do that in sort of cohorts. Um, as I remember talking about that when we started the programs, are we uh, tracking or measuring sort of results from the program as I know we're only a couple of years in, but how, how are we looking at results with the hires ourselves or, or measuring that? Yeah, um, so Lisa Guadagno in my office is um, sort of leading uh, the, the, the system-wide initiative. And one of the things that we implemented at the same time and you know, full disclosure, this is the third university that I initiated something like this. The first time I did it at a department level, the second time was at a college level. And this is the first example of something like this that I know of at, the, at a public university system level. Usually they're much sort of smaller pockets because building those, those mutual mentoring cohorts is harder when you have a geographical distance, right? If we said we're all gonna have hire five people who are all here physically on this one campus, they would be, now that we're up to 20 faculty with this fourth year of hires, where we have a certain um, cohort that's forming and they come up to Pullman, they go down to Tri-Cities, uh, Lisa has them convene uh, via Zoom across the system. They've established a mentoring program where they're mentoring each other and also selecting mentors from outside of their immediate area, that sort of mutual mentoring model. And so far we've had full um, retention of these faculty. And um, I dare say if we were to compare that to individual faculty who were hired to do this kind of work, they wouldn't have that support network, but we really should, we can and should collect the metrics on this. Mm -hmm. Um, what I will say is that one of the two previous institutions that I was at, we did this and we set up what I, what I call a mutual mentoring network program. It's a sort of a Mellon funded initiative that really focuses on the, the, the dynamic two way relationship between mentor and mentee. So it moves beyond the sort of top down mentorship, but understands that you're learning from your mentees as much as you're you know, mentoring them. And that network-based mentoring philosophy, I initiated when we hired over five years, we hired eight faculty of color in the department that had only had one. And we developed this mutual mentoring network. And when I left as department chair, they ended the program and they had lost five of the eight faculty in that program. Now I can't say for sure that's a chicken and egg, but some of those faculty have said to me, <coughs> once we stop that really uh, transparent mentoring philosophy. It went right back to that traditional top-down, you know, let me take you out for a beer kind of thing, which excludes certain relationships and forming. Uh, when you formalize it and, and you sort of bring down the level, it doesn't seem like you're asking for remedial help or special favors, but it's sort of part of the part of the culture. Um, so so far we have excellent retention. I don't know if anyone has left. It's, it's early in the program. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, and this may seem counterintuitive, but if, you know, uh, retention is one way to measure, um, but these are all stellar superstar faculty. And I don't think we could consider it um, a, a failure if one of them, you know, gets a named professorship at a distinguished university. We want them to stay, but more importantly, we want them to stay in academia and contribute their scholarship you know, nationally and internationally and succeed as faculty member, uh, faculty members. But if we're doing our job right, we will make the climate such that they would want to stay here. For, you know. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. I mean, again, it goes goes to us distinguishing ourselves and, you know, being able to write up the program and to have results. And I think that would be good for a lot of reasons. Yeah, I would like to, um, years ago, maybe six years ago, I wrote a short um, Inside Higher Ed article about cluster hiring and the importance of that mentoring philosophy accompanying it. Lots of other universities have done cluster hires like this, but I do not know that they include that mentoring piece, that mm -hmm. mentoring philosophy piece. Uh, and since we have lots of data to show that, not just for this purpose, but that network-based mentoring 
increases faculty reports of success and also retention that that we have statistical data on that. And the idea is not just to focus on that mentoring for these uh, cluster hire folks, but to scale that up across the WSU system. And we have started to work with certain department chairs who have expressed interest in, in incorporating this philosophy into mentoring at the juniors, you know, mid-career and senior levels, because we all need mentoring at different parts of our careers on different topics. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right, we should collect the data and then I would love to publish something that talks about what WSU has done and really hold it up as a national model. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yes, Laura. Um, I love your concept of quarter career. And I just think it is so important. Um, can you just talk a little bit about just some of the the topics mm. that they include in their curriculum? Yeah, absolutely. You know, things like uh, presentation skills, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, data literacy, and in subjects that you wouldn't normally think of. You know, you're not in a math class doing you know uh, number crunching, but you know, if you're in anthropology or sociology, how do you take quantitative data and use descriptive statistics to present it? How do you analyze, problem solve, small group working? Mm -hmm. So really all those skills that you can imagine. I mean, it was so funny. We, we had an Alaska Airlines day um, this past year, and I asked the execs in a panel with our students sitting there like, what are the skills you need for someone you're gonna hire? And they all said, you know, data literacy, oral presentation, a willingness to work in group, be able to work in groups, critical thinking, problem solving, all of those things, writing, giving oral presentations, those kinds of skills that can apply regardless of where you are. And that's, that's so much better to do it in a, a context rather than some of the traditional base courses of um, what they sometimes call dummy English and yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I just think that that's, that's a great innovation. Yeah, absolutely. A really successful Cook Stratton who works in UCOR was, has been heading that up. And uh, like I say, we want to continue to, to scale it up um, so that we have, I think, I think it's about 120 faculty who've gone through the program and it's only in the second year. So if we keep going, we'll, we'll get yeah. to everybody. It's still early, but it'd be interesting to, uh, at some point, get the perspective of students about how much that has helped them. As because I can I can see it helping them just going through some of their, their major exactly. upper level courses, much less when they're transitioning into a career. You know that was part of the philosophy. Don't wait till their senior year to learn these career ready skills, yeah. right? Like start when you're a first and second year student and you can use them. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, could you um, speak a little more about the faculty salary at Booty Plaza? Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a little more about what that, what that looks like? Yeah, so, um, and, and happy to give you the, 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 um, the short blurb. Um, I think it was in our, was it in our January or March yes. meeting? <clears throat> Laura Greiner Hill and I came in and, and, and gave a deep dive on it, but essentially, um, when I first arrived, we had a, a report from the Association of Faculty Women, and they had done a report of salaries and noted what they perceived of as gender disparity in salaries um, across our system. And this concerned me, of course, it concerned Kirk, it concerned all of us. Um, but one of the things that they did not do because they didn't have access to the data or because they were doing this by volunteer committee. They didn't look at salaries by rank, by years and rank in our department. That is critical um, because, you know, that's really the only way you can see true inequity uh, that you can correct. You know, if you have, um, I'm just making this up, if you had more men in engineering and and more women in humanities, for yeah, example, yeah, I mean, yeah, for, for example, example yeah. then if you looked at their salaries, you would yeah. see it's salary disparity, but it's by discipline. It's not yeah. that there's uh, discrimination necessarily going on there. So um, at least in their salaries. So, um, you know, in response to this, um, we took a million dollars of the university's base funds and um, uh, Laura Greiner Hill, and Don Holbrook and I pulled all the data uh, 
by for our just for our faculty, all full time faculty by rank, by years and rank, by department, and then we sent that out to the deans and we asked them for recommendations from the data they saw. Now sometimes it can be performance issues. Maybe there hasn't been a, a strong annual faculty review. Other cases it might be subfield. Even with an anthropology, a medical anthropologist tends to have a higher salary than a cultural anthropologist, right? So explain to us the data you see and make recommendations. And I think we had something like recommendations for something like three or 400 faculty to make adjustments to bring them up closer to that mean by rank by years. Ago. And in the end, the million dollars got us a significant way towards uh, true equity. We raised the salaries, I think it was 225 faculty roughly. Um, and they ranged between four and 5,000 to their base to bring them up, like I say, closer to that mean. We would like to keep going. We probably would need to do that a couple of more years and then keep looking at it. The idea is now that we have a methodology, getting people to think about faculty salaries that way. Otherwise, it tends to be a bit ad hoc. You know, um, Professor A has a uh, an offer to go to um, UCLA, and they say UCLA is going to pay me this, and so we match it. Well, maybe Professor B didn't go out and get another offer, but maybe Professor B is just as strong as Professor A, right? So that tend the market forces tend to play in a little bit much, and we just need to make sure we're being equitable. Doesn't mean we would never do that anymore, but we need to be make sure we're not creating inequities through that process. Does that? Help? Yeah, no, that's really helpful, and I appreciate the recap. Um, I think what I was looking for, and I just did not articulate myself well enough was that process piece, the methodology, and then trying to land, uh, is there some sort of policy or how are we taking the work that's been done and um, ensuring that it is creating a practice mm -hmm. that lives on? Because doing the assessment, unpacking the problem, recognizing we have a problem, and then how do we keep that practice continuing yeah. so that, um, we make sure that there is salary equity. It's such an issue. And um, I would hate to see, you know, a million dollars is not going to solve it. It probably just touched the surface that it becomes something that, um, you know, lives within the organization and we prioritize it. And so a process allows us the opportunity to make it a policy and a practice. And so that's really what I was trying yeah. to speak to. Yeah, and sorry. I did not I'm, um, articulate that very well, but thank you for well, taking well, it and continuing to, to try and get at what I was hoping for. What we decided to do is do this every year. Send out this, whether or not we have another million dollars laying around, to send out this data to deans to discuss with their chairs every okay. year. Because there are things they can do within the college, even if we don't have new central funds to do this. And they can also use it in their assessment when Professor A comes and says, I have a job offer from UCLA. They can look and say, okay, they're saying they want the salary. What will that do to salary equity within my department? Every, this information is, is public in the sense we're all public employees. You can get that data. And chairs can ask for that data. Deans can ask for that data. But by doing it in this transparent way, where you're seeing it all at once and you're not just seeing one faculty member's salary out of context, it, I think it will help. And if we commit to doing it every year as an assessment, then again, I think it just keeps that up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, my second question, and then I promise I'll stop. Um, I, I heard you when you opened your, your comments, and I'm still processing, but um, losing Chip Hunter is a big deal. And um, so I also thought that I heard you say, did you see the Dean of Education as well? Yeah. So those are two really significant losses. And I'm just curious if you can speak to, I mean, I appreciate kind of, you know, moving forward, how um, you're planning to ensure that we have the continuity and, and the leadership in place in the process. Um, is there anything that at our level um, that we need to know in terms of what we can do to ensure that we stabilize and um, retain talent like that? I mean, those are public, forward-facing positions, strong leaders that this university had out front and sort of big losses. So absolutely. 
Well, in the um, in the case of Mike, you know, after 10 years, he, he basically came to me and he said, you know, I want to do some other things. And he has some research uh, program. He has a research program in his own that he wants to pursue. Um, but he gave us enough lead time that he will serve, as I said, through August of 24. And so we can do, you know, do a robust search this year. We're starting to talk to search firms. Um, so that he will, he's not physically going anywhere, and I know that he will be able to be there and mentor and, and provide support throughout the search process to talk to the, talk to the individuals, for example. Um, so that one we've known for a bit of time. I don't remember when we announced it, but, but you know, I was, I was fortunate, or we are fortunate, that he's given us that amount of lead time so that we can work together to shore up the leadership. Um, Chip, I just found out within the past week, and it's just being publicly announced today. You know, I think he made this decision, and um, you know, the the timing is tough because it's May, um, and it, it didn't give me or any of us very much time to mentally adjust or to think about a possibility for an interim. Obviously, we cannot do a search on a dime and and do it well. Um, you know, Debbie is a very, very strong senior associate dean. She's the one who um, really initiated the next uh, next person foods program. She's been involved in everything that he has been doing. She subs for him when he's traveling. She serves on the dean's council on occasion. A uh, very strong advocate. Um, you know, I had a, an informal conversation with Scott Carson, who was very happy that she was willing to serve in an interim capacity. I've appointed her to a two-year interim because I don't want to rush the search. They have an accreditation review in April, and we need steadiness in the college to be able to make sure we're shining the way I know we will shine in April. And so if we were in the middle of doing a search and she's clearly either a candidate, which she may be, or, um, or uh, saying she's not a candidate, which in some ways is even worse because then when the creditors come, they don't feel like they're speaking to the dean, right? They're speaking to someone who's a placeholder. So I've appointed her for two years. We will do a search, national search in the fall of 24. And then that will get us someone in place by August of 25. She is willing to serve as long as we need her to. Uh, she's been in the college for, for quite a while. Um, has really deep, really deep knowledge. Um, and I feel like the college is in very good hands. And so did the, the chairs and directors as well. They felt very confident in her. There really wasn't anyone else who was raising their hand saying, please pick me if they were unanimous in their support. And as far as what you can all do, once we get to the point of, if you have thoughts about what would be critical for the either of those next leaders, um, Please do let us know, help us advertise the positions through your channels. Um, this will be a full national slash international search. So please do help us get the word out about these opportunities. Any other questions? Yes. What is, do we know the average tenure of a, um, of a dean or faculty member? Here last at time I checked, it was five years nationally. I don't know about here. But nationally, last time I checked, it was five years. Um, and so both of them have served almost twice, in the case of Mike, certainly, um, almost twice that time. You know, uh, eight years is a long time. Eight is pretty close to that. And I think at that point, both of them just felt like they were ready for the next stage in their careers. And so, you know, this isn't a case where I felt like there was in the acrimony between them and us. They were both very torn. Chip seemed very emotional when he was selling his chairs. But um, you know, those are the best circumstances. If you're going to have a dean move on, those are the best circumstances when they're seeing something that they want to move on to. Other comments or questions? Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate it. Um, Next, we're going to go on to our focus discussion and our legislative session update. And interim vice president for external affairs and government relations, Chris Mueller.
Well, good morning and uh, thank you all. You are uh, currently, just for reference, uh, receiving a, uh, a front and back uh, one pager of some of our legislative session outcomes on the front. You'll see um, what happened in the operating budget, outlining our requests and and, um, and and what the outcome was. And on the back, focuses on the capital budget and a few other uh, few other notable items. Um, really delighted here uh, the, to be here with you today to um, deliver some really positive news. Um, and um, and I'm very appreciative of all of the people that helped get us to this outcome, including uh, members of this board. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of talk through the operating budget a little bit, and then we'll and then we'll transition to to capital. Um, on the operating budget side, and let me just say that at a high level, you know, we didn't get everything we asked for, but we came um, remarkably close. And we also ended up uh, securing some, some funding for some assignments that were given to us from the governor and the legislature that we are um, uncommonly excited about. Um, so so uh, in terms of, of our policy level requests, um, uh, we were fully funded uh, for our uh, request to support our nursing salary enhancement that will go to support our uh, reaccreditation effort in the College of Nursing. Um, we were fully funded for our request to establish uh, new academic programming and social work at WC Tri-Cities and uh, in public health at uh, campuses in Pullman, Vancouver, and Spokane. Um, we, uh, for the first time, and I don't want to say recorded history, but our maintenance and operation request for the uh, new Vancouver Life Sciences building was fully funded. Um, those things tend to happen. All state buildings kind of get the same thing. And so it's really unusual that we get full funding for our um, requests uh, for, for maintenance and operation, but really delighted that we did. Um, the Ruckles House Center, which was mentioned earlier, um, you know, it, we were um, asked to submit a request to support uh, core funding for the Ruckles House Center, which basically receives uh, very marginal state support uh, for core funding. They're very otherwise heavily dependent on state funded assignments, extramurally funded assignments and philanthropic giving. Um, so we uh, were blessed to receive some core funding uh, for the Ruckles House Center that will um, make them uh, less susceptible to um, the, the uh, changing economy and, and the whims of, of donors' ability to support uh, the center. Uh, on the, the compensation front, um, classified staff uh, were funded for 4% in fiscal year 24 and a 3% in fiscal year 25. For faculty, uh, professional staff, and graduate students, the state provided the equivalent of resources to uh, fund a 2.2% uh, enhancement in the first fiscal year and 1.6 in the second fiscal year. That is not an announcement as to what WSU is going to do. It's merely reporting of the resources that have been made available to us um, for that purpose. Um, beyond that, um, we, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we frequently uh, get uh, what I term as assignments uh, from uh, the legislature or the governor's office to work on a research project or what have you. Um, and as I reported to you previously, uh, for this legislative cycle, we really had an inordinate number of these kinds of requests. One of the things that you're always worried about is that they will displace some of the things that, that we're wanting. <clears throat> and that, that, uh, particularly as it relates to our academic programming, didn't happen here. Um, the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures is uh, uh, at that 7.7 .7 million in the first biennium, it actually grows to be just less than 10 million in the second biennium, is a significant assignment from the governor that was fully funded um, and is going to allow us to establish a significant uh, research program headquartered at WSU Tri-Cities. Um, but but really uh, with resources from the, uh, uh, that will um, have impacts for the broader system uh, to uh, help us uh, help the state 
uh, imagine a or develop a reimagined energy future for our, for our state. So that's really exciting. Um, really excited to see uh, a proposal that came from the Mesa program to establish a Mesa program at WSU Everett, um, which was fully funded. Um, we've had some conversation previously around legislation to establish a statewide program for a Native American scholarship. That legislation did not go through, um, but um, due to the relationships that we have developed, um, and I'm gonna uh, particularly give the tip of the cap to um, WSU Zoe Heigl Strong, um, we're able to secure an appropriation, a one-time appropriation uh, to develop a uh, Native American scholarship program at WSU only. Um, it, now it's one-time funding, um, but how I would view this is it uh, gives us the opportunity to develop uh, proof of concept that could be used either for uh, further funding uh, uh, in, in the out years or um, uh, perhaps more likely even for a statewide uh, program as was originally envisioned in, in uh, the legislation. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, I would note the um, uh, unusually large uh, funding 2.4 million for the biennium that is ongoing to support the development of a journalism fellowship program in the Murrow College of Communication. Uh, eight, it's a two year program, uh, eight fellows per year. So you're talking about adding uh, in effect, 16 uh, reporters covering civic affairs across our state and in the modern media environment of which I am in exile. Uh, um, 16 new reporters um, covering civic affairs is a notable improvement. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really exciting to see the Murrow College called upon to perform um, this service. Um, just a few things before I transition to, to capital uh, uh, to provide a little bit of context. Um, not everybody did this well. And by everybody, I mean not everybody, not just in higher ed, but I mean functionally, uh, functional areas of state government. Um, last year, late last year, we kind of talked about what was being seen as the bending of the trajectory in terms of state revenues. And that trajectory has has flattened a bit. Um, the one thing we have to remember is right before the first uh, uh, legislative budget proposal was introduced, the state lost a little north of a billion dollars in revenue with the declining revenue forecast. Um, and uh, so that had a lot of us quite concerned. Um, the the final uh, the final operating budget agreement that's down the governor's desk does show a flattening, flattening, it's still growing, but, but not the same trajectory it was of, of state spending. And so, um, so what you're seeing here uh, for WSU uh, is not being enjoyed across all functional areas of state government. Um, the, the other thing that, that I would note is that in a lot of these, I'm gonna say most of these enhancements, very little of this is state general fund money. Compensation is, and appropriately so, but, um, but the, the, the high demand degrees that were uh, funded, uh, you know, the, these types of things are coming out of the Washington Education Investment Account, uh, which was established in 2019. Um, it has money in it largely because of the undersubscribed nature of the Washington College Grant. Um, and so we were able to, um, uh, to, get those, uh, to get those funded that way. Um, and then also the, uh, the Climate Commitment Act uh, that the state approved uh, previously, uh, which has generated some revenues to generally support activities in the, uh, in the climate arena. And that's how uh, things like the Institute for Northwest Energy Futures are being funded. Um, so, um, and again, even with these funding sources, you know, we're, we're receiving some things that, that not everybody is. And so um, one of the conversations I had in January with um, a leading budget staffer, just kind of talking through what we're working on, um, one of the things that really stuck with me was um, she indicated you asked for the right stuff. And the question was, is there going to be resource available 
to do it. And, <clears throat> and there was resource available in the end for us, um, but not for everybody. So um, that's, that's the operating budget side. Um, one, one thing, I, I guess one more thing on the operating budget, and we have, which we haven't talked about, and, and we were not the instigator behind this, but it is worth noting uh, as it relates to the Washington College grant, which you recall established in 2019, um, the, the eligibility to receive a full Washington College grant last year was improved from 55% median family income to 60. And there was some conversation in the legislature this year to improve that again. And it kind of died off and went behind the scenes. But the final budget, when it got kicked out, improves that from 60% median family income to 65% median family income. Um, we've been doing a lot of, of, of talking about how affordable uh, the public higher education is in Washington. And this is going to um, make it even more affordable for more people. Um, transitioning to capital budget, uh, this one's uh, pretty simple. Uh, we got everything we asked for at the level that we requested with one exception. Uh, and that was for a remote storage facility for library collections in the Pullman campus. It was our number eight of nine priorities, uh, but everything else was fully funded. And this was in a, a very difficult environment with the legislature, uh, very understandably having a, a strong desire to put a lot of money into affordable housing. And some of the budget proposals that we saw were really detrimental to higher education. And um, this was the one that we probably sweated over the most. Um, and in the end, uh, we got just about everything that, that we wanted. And um, you know, even from some of our advocates, when we were looking at one budget proposal that was really good and one that wasn't, you know, and, and, and the comment was, well, you know, we'll split the difference. And you know, but splitting the difference, the 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 the, the budget proposal that wasn't so good was was so poor that splitting the difference would have left us with a really poor capital budget. So I'm really delighted to report that um, that just about everything we asked for it was funded. Uh, our minor works budgets, this is really a watershed year. Um, uh, we have rarely gotten a funding of, of this kind for preservation and um, small scale uh, renovations and equipment purchases. Um, uh, the, uh, the new engineering building, which was mentioned uh, previously, uh, fully funded uh, at, at the $40 million level. The, the design and site preparation for the team help uh, uh, building on the Spokane campus uh, is, is there. Uh, even the Not Dairy, which your predecessors have uh, looked at for um, a long, long time. Uh, we've got this for phase one of the two phase renovation of the Not Dairy. Um, uh, was funded and having uh, stomped through the not dairy last August. Uh, and and uh, I think I'm still got shoes that are um, uh, worse for the wear. Uh, boy, that place needs it. Uh, Bustad Hall uh, renovation um, and the energy efficiency funding uh, all there were really, uh, were really delighted. And, and for good measure, there was a million dollars we didn't ask for. Uh, thank you, Senator Schessler to support uh, some of our A uh, research uh, units. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're really uh, delighted there. I would say, um, you know, we had three pillars to our, uh, we had the best capital budget message and we've had since, certainly since I've been here and three pillars to that. One, it was a streamlined request. We tried to advance a request that didn't ask for too much and reflected our priorities um, and was and was fundable, and so so instead of you know kind of you know the heyday of the late '90s you know and asking for that kind of level, we asked for what we thought we could get, and so that we could keep our priorities in order. Um, and so we were a good actor there. Um, the focus on deferred maintenance, not just with our minor works uh, requests, but also with a number of the smaller scale renovations that you find throughout our request. Uh, and even the new building, right, at, 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 that we're working on. Um, I mentioned uh, engineering that will ultimately uh, result in the, in the um, 
removal of, of one of our most uh, energy inefficient buildings. Um, I didn't mention the uh, arts and sciences uh, infrastructure where we have some of our, our biggest infrastructure problems. Uh, that gets the ball rolling on what will ultimately be the replacement of Heald Hall. Um, so all throughout our request, you can see this, this uh, focus on deferred maintenance. And, and importantly, staff, legislative staff could see this too. And then finally, um, the first meaningful toe in the water in trying to pair state appropriation with philanthropic giving. And we did it at a level that um, is really uncommon. Um, so much so that I don't want to set expectations too high that we're going to be able to do that every time. But, but um, even in the, the most challenging budget proposals we saw, the engineering building was always there. Um, so uh, I, um, you know, as we, you know, I think reflected in the messaging that we had for the legislature, we really um, impressed upon them our desire that they reward good behavior, and they did. Um, uh, one final note then before I turn it over for question and conversations. Um, WSU rarely plays the transportation budget for obvious reasons, um, but this year another very late breaking uh, opportunity came up regarding the development of a, of a sustainable aviation fuel research and development center at uh, Everett's pain field. Uh, and um, one of uh, WSU's strongest uh, supporters, Senator Mark Elias, uh, is the transportation budget and the chair. Um, and uh, working with him and with Snohomish County, I developed this proposal for six and a half million dollars for seed funding to develop this uh, research and development center uh, that will um, include uh, a core component of what, of what would be the world's first um, experimental aviation fuel repository. Much like a, you know some of our ag facilities, you may be familiar with just the notion of a, of a seed bank, you know where you'll walk in and have thousands of different you know, uh, seeds for varieties of, 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 of wheat or what have you, um, to, the opportunity to really put the state of Washington on the map as the home to the world's only fuel repository for experimental fuels in, in sustainable aviation jet fuel. Um, really excited to, to have that funded in the final budget. And the idea is that um, uh, with, uh, it, it will help uh, uh, design a, um, a, a large scale uh, testing facility to test aviation fuels on that we could uh, then go to the federal government uh, to seek a construction funding for. And by we, it's, it's, it would be Snohomish County with WCB being the research partner. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to entertain questions and conversation. Are there questions, comments? I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, back to the Governor legislative requests on this uh, Native American scholarship program. What was initially asked for in that proposal? Well, so the the proposal, the it was a the bill uh, was silent on funding level, which was elegant because it allowed the budget writers to determine here's what we think we can afford. Uh, but what what was originally called for was a statewide program. As I recall, that would be administered by the Student Achievement Council, which um, you know administers the state's financial aid programs uh, and um, uh, and uh, federally recognized members of federally recognized tribes could um, be eligible to receive uh, funding up to whatever funding level was determined to be made available. That bill did not pass, and so what uh, the conversation that we uh, we started having with our uh, legislative patron was really in the area of maybe she wanted to do a one and a half million uh, and we're able to get uh, 1.2 million on a one time basis. Um, so, um, but it was again, uh, when, when we were working on the bill, the thought was never for a WSU specific program, it was a statewide program. Um, and usually when bills, lots of times when bills like this die, there's a thought, well, I'm gonna, we're going to go talk to the budget folks and see if we can get a proviso. And lots of times that doesn't work. But usually, but it's rare that, that you would go and say, 
we want a budget proviso, but we only want it for this institution. And so this is really unique that WSU gets to play in this space. Another question I had was that the journalism fellowship program. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit more? So Merle College is going to be in charge of that, and correct. So team reporters, how are they going to how how's that going to work? Well, um, so there's a lot of implementation that's still to be uh, implementation decisions uh, still to be determined. In fact, um, at noon I'm going to be meeting with them to kind of talk about this. But it's again, it's eight fellows in the first year. I believe you have to have be uh, within three years of having received. Uh, a credential at a university, uh, a, a, um, credential at a university or community college. Um, there's a pres prescribed salary uh, for each of the fellows, um, and they will be distributed across the state, um, providing content that um, that uh, uh, media outlets would be able to use. Um, uh, there's also some uh, study components uh, that uh, for WSU to provide an annual report on the state of the media landscape in Washington. Um, and, uh, and there's a requirement that at least half of the uh, fellows come from the Murrow School. So it is not exclusively uh, for Murrow grads, but it is, um, we made sure that um, we're going to get at least half of it. That's another. Um, on uh, these new programs that we got funded, and, and by the way, kudos on this overall program. Yeah. I'm particularly excited about the um, the uh, deferred maintenance. Uh, I guess the minor minor works preservation. Uh, Forty million, not so minor. So right. <laughs> that's really amazing and and much needed. Uh, and this may be partly a question for for uh, Kirk and Elizabeth, but um, so we've got the social work degree and public health uh, uh, degree fully funded, and also the nursing salary enhancement. Um, my question is, I'm, you know, these are obviously very needed roles in our society, and we, uh, we could, you know, all be very thrilled if more of those graduates were out in society working today and tomorrow. My fear, and I hope you're going to tell me not to worry about this, is that those jobs, while very much needed in society, are not jobs that people actually want to have. And so the state wants us to stand up those degree programs, but it may be hard to get people to want to enroll in them. Is that right or wrong? You know, in this, in those two particular cases, you know, there are some times where the state may have a perceived that we don't have a demand for. I'm sure that has happened in the past. And in, in the case for these two particular ones, we decided to focus on to submit in this proposal degrees that the colleges and campuses were already developing because of market research they had done, demonstrated demand, and they happened to overlap with state priorities. That's generally how we're going to be forming these budgets, because you're right, if we stand up something that sounds really nice and no one enrolls in it, then, you know, we've got faculty who don't have a good place to apply their skills. Okay, so these are, are high demand, yes. both society really needs them, and we've got students who really want to get these degrees. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, Brett. More of a comment than a question, Chris. This kind of success doesn't fall out of thin air. So I just wanted to be thankful of you and your team being engaged. And also, uh, the aforementioned senator, I, I weighed in with him as well and said if it didn't, if it didn't get noticed, I noticed. And thank you for going to bat for WSU during the session because I know he's in a similar. In the legislature, I know he's in a similar situation. I am. If it's an ag question, everybody looks to you. And uh, regarding ag, the, it's funny to watch people ask questions. I ask about ag. So, um, the uh, the two stations that have needed funding for a long time, Crosser's needed attention for a long time in that regard. And the land station. What happens is a lot of ag research goes on in Pullman. 
Oh, that's great. Sooner or later, you have to put it in the real world. And that's what these research stations are for. So land the standing joke is, uh, those of you who've read the book of Genesis, where the spirit of the Lord brooded over creation and the dry land appeared. That was Lynn, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if it grows in Lynn, it'll grow in. And we, and we own it, and we have a station there. So it's world renowned for being the driest, the driest of the dry research stations. And this is a great, great benefit to have. Thank you. If, if I could, for a second there, we had fantastic support. And it's just, it's not just, you know, me and, and my circle of friends going up the hill. We had uh, uh, circles of support for all of these things that were really critical. Um, the ag lobby uh, was really helpful in working on capital budget. So when I'm talking about wine grape folks uh, working towards dairy, right? Um, because they know that sooner or later behind dairy, there's something that they care about. So they were really helpful. We did the unusual thing this year with our minor works uh, request. Normally we get the money in and then we kind of said, okay, you know, which pipe is leaking the most. Um, in this particular case, we made a commitment to, to the ag lobby that if we get full funding and you're willing to support us, we're gonna, here, here's a list of projects for all of our research and extension centers. I'm gonna say there's like three, pro, at least three projects for all four of them. And we're talking uh, siding, boilers, roof replacements. Um, these things are, are, are not things people are gonna put a name on, right? Um, uh, but, and, then, and it's why it's so hard to get funding for these things. So we really appreciate them leaning. The Ag Lobby actually also worked on um, compensation for us because it mean, meant that much to them, which we really, really appreciate. But, but beyond that, um, you know, I, I have to give a shout out to, um, you know, as you all know, we went through a leadership change in our unit halfway through session. Um, and there were some times that I just needed to disappear. And uh, Connor Haggerty, who uh, we promoted in uh, late last year to assistant director of state relations, all of a sudden got handed a lot of uh, work and assignments responsibility he didn't know he was going to get. Uh, Katamor uh had just come over from, from our federal team to work on the state side, and likewise uh, for her. Um, they were representing WSU uh, in, um, in our circle of friends with other um, public universities by themselves. Um, and so really appreciate it, appreciate it for that. Uh, certainly appreciate uh, the engagement that some of you had, uh, which uh, which really really helps. And thank you for saying thank you, as my dad used to say, because um, we are very much in thank you mode. Um, you know, the we were on the legislative agenda uh, in and you know in the communities and our campus communities, Spokane, Tri Cities, Vancouver in particular, in a big big way. Um, you know, the Association of Social Workers really came to bat for us on the social work degree. Um, several nursing organizations were really supportive of our nursing ass. So, so, you know, what we want to do is, is provide layers of advocacy. Um, and, um, and we did that. And, uh, um, you know, I, I can't tell you it was your email that made all the difference, but I sure wouldn't have wanted to find out what would happen if you didn't send it. Right. So, um, so thank you to everybody for participating. Well, just a quick question. Um, this piece of paper, really cool. Thank you. It's the most um, clear um, uh, level of information I've seen on this activity. Um, but uh, I have a question around, could you remind me how we go about streamlining requests or visibility on federal funds? So I'm looking at sources of funding, you know, around philanthropy, foundation, connect the dots. You're, you're talking about state. What's our organized approach to any access to federal funding infrastructure, if at all? Because I can't remember. So, so Glenda Becker Fenter runs our uh, DC program at some point in time. I hope you all get a chance to have some exposure to her. Um, and those opportunities kind of come and go. Generally speaking, um, we this federal government does not fund uh, historically bricks and mortar. 
Now we've got some notable exceptions to that that are recent, right? Uh, USDA is going to build a hundred plus million dollar new building uh, on the Pullman campus, uh, but that's like the first federally funded building in at least two decades, right? So uh, the other thing that the federal government generally doesn't do so much is provide ongoing funds for um, for activities. So a lot of these things that we're talking about here, you know, new academic degree programs, things like that. You know, when we need to hire faculty that we're going to pay for them full time, that's what that's what the state is going to do. Federal government's going to do a lot of the re, all of the research funding that um, the state just generally does very little of. I think I think my point is that funds flow somewhere. They flow to business. They flow to institutions. And somehow that's where there might be opportunities for partnering um, because of massive you know federal funds that are flowing. So um, yeah. we do we do have a pretty clear strategy internally for that Linda runs uh, along with Chris and the whole GR team working with deans and chancellors to identify areas of opportunity and things that where we're strong and where there's also alignment of our delegation around those. So we talk to each member about things that they tend to be interested in and they in turn are looking for opportunities and places to insert. WSU initiatives and things like that. So in the earmark process, we have several um, you know, proposals from WSU that are advancing by different members you know, through the lengthy uh, federal process. So yeah. we try and coordinate all of these things. We try and be transparent internally about how we're doing it. And we engage a lot of broad sense of leadership. I mean, part of the reason for success is that internal organization and focused strategy about what things we want to be doing, where we want to be going, that allows us to really respond quickly. For example, we had, Chris, correct me, I think it's 24 hours to respond, maybe it's 48, to a couple major, major requests, you know, $100 million worth of ass. And people said, this is our strategy, this is the projects we know we're working on, this is where we're going, this is where the value of planning comes to play because people aren't making stuff up. They got this is something we need to do, and we were able to turn those around to members extremely fast. Um, and it was really notable to watch that all that planning work all of a sudden pays off in a big way. So, and with the the strength of our state delegation, I mean, all of a sudden we have a lot more good problems to have than we used to, and so that kind of uh, that phenomenon that we went through it might have been a few more than forty eight hours, but it wasn't much more. Um, and and we're, we're not the only ones going through that, uh, lots are. But, but um, generally speaking, you know, there's not a whole lot of, you know, the state's gonna fund this part of an initiative and the feds are gonna fund that part, but it does happen occasionally. Uh, the state paid for the teardown of Johnson Hall, which is where we're gonna put the new USDA building. Yeah. You know, so there are occasions where some of that happens. Um, but as you can imagine, um, uh, proposals that are contingent, you know, to a government that are contingent on another government doing something. Um, boy, that's a lot of dots that need to connect. Um, so, anyway. I think we have time for one more question. Are you, are you sure? Doug? Well, <clears throat> Chris, um, congratulations to you and your team. You really great job. And I can't help but think <clears throat> when I was I'm doing my orientations and I was in a car with Olivia traveling on the Pullman campus, hearing a lot of this. She must be smiling as well. <laughs> um, my question is on that third pillar you mentioned, and I just want to know uh, a little snapshot of how it works. Where philanthropy and state money come together, is that where do you sit down with the foundation and talk about where private dollars might match state dollars? How does that work? Well, so, so generally, first of all, we're new at this. We're relatively new at this. Um, uh, I, it wasn't, I didn't so much sit down with the foundation as much as the college and the foundation had kind of had this worked up where, where our office came in was going to the state. And I want to say three years ago now to just, and before we even knew the Boylan project was going to rise to the top um, in terms of philanthropic, philanthropic success, but going to the state to just talk to problem solve with them about, okay, what if we advance a project and we're going to have, you know, the state pay for half and a, and a donor pay for half. What happens if, you know, the don donations don't come in at the same, you know, those types right. of things. So it's conditional. Well, so, so we wanted to 
make it so that it wasn't conditional. And we want to understand if we're going to have a problem, we want to know that now before we make a commitment. And so, uh, and, 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 this, and the state was really helpful in problem solving with us about that in such a way that we knew that uh, if we if we requested 40 million from the state and for some reason the donor funding didn't come through, we were still going to have something to show for it. Yeah. Is it new to us or is it new to all in higher ed? No, uh, other institutions have had more success at this than we have, but I don't know that anyone's come in with half of the yeah. funding that we did. That was really unusual. Um, so it's, others have had done a little bit of this. We just we haven't. Um, thank you. Um, sorry, I know we're pressed for time, but could you comment briefly on the um, salary increase for faculty yep. and how it compared to the other universities' asks and what was? Yeah, so you know we're, we're going back to the the whole conversation about um, the, the the state's methodology for funding higher ed salaries for faculty, professional staff, graduate students, which is dependent upon new tuition revenue. They assume new tuition revenue, even if we know that tuition revenue doesn't exist. So we, we've been on a campaign for five years to try to get them to improve the formula. I think a, a little bit that unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately or unfortunately, WSU already had the most generous fund split uh, in terms of percentage of state support funding are their uh, assumed COLAs. And so what the governor tried to do is, well, let's bring everybody up to the same level, which really didn't do much for us. Um, where the, what the legislature ended up doing was they split the difference a little bit and they recognized basically those institutions, uh, institution uh, who is going to have more tuition revenue and for, for which a 100% state appropriation is not necessary to provide the prescribed four and three. And so, um, so uh, nobody received a, a, a fund split that will allow them to uh, provide 4% and 3% without having to take on some level of pain somewhere else. Um, so does that help? I mean, it's not the answer you wanted in terms of this. And, but I'll tell you what, we, we, uh, we, we've never been more aggressive on this issue than we were this year. And we, and we had some friends helping us. Um, and it's been a hard rock to roll up that hill because it's expensive. John, can I just say a little bit? Sure. I can wrap up here. I could be great work, but also the fact that there was change over in, in the whole process at the top there, but kudos to your team and you especially for taking the ball and carrying it at all. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Excellent report. I think um, we are going to take a 10 minute break um, and start at five minutes to the hour. And we'll then move into our focused discussion item with a report from Chief Compliance and Risk Officers. Thank you. Excellent timing.
So we're going to now go move into a report from the Chief Compliance and Risk Officer, Executive Vice President for Finance and Administration, and Chief Compliance and Risk Officer, Cheryl Camarazel. Is that right? Camarazel. Camarazel. Thank you. It's just it's almost as tough as Shuttler. Thank you. Well, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. And certainly, Charles needs no introduction here today. But I wanted to thank both Regent Shower and Regent Shetler for letting us move this presentation into this committee meeting. Um, we've already heard that the Finance Committee is going to be three hours today. We will use every moment of that. And what was happening with this agenda item, we were taking time away from Charles over and over and over again to the point where she was barely going to have an opportunity to present this. These are big, weighty topics for the board to consider, and what we need is for Cheryl to provide the context for how the issue is addressing these things. It'll certainly lead to some discussion for you, and we wanted to provide some space to do that. And so, yeah. Thank you. That is why you've got packed slides. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time at which I was trying to get as much as I could onto the slides, but we'll just spend time going through them. So. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of real big um, compliance uh, areas for higher ed and for WSU, and then um, a couple of specific risk areas for us that we're making some progress on, some incidents we've had, and then just an update on our uh, enterprise risk management program and where we are right now. So um, I'm going to go ahead and begin with uh, the Clery Act. So at your last meeting, uh, our internal auditor, Heather, uh, gave you some, thank you, um, gave a summary of the audit she had done on the our Clery Act compliance. And I wanted to spend some time addressing the response. And before I do that, I want to step back a little bit and talk about the Clery Act without, um, because it is such an enormous federal uh, area of compliance for higher education and to think about what it really means. It came out of um, actually uh, a horrible crime and murder of a student. Um, and this, the law came about, the parents basically said, we didn't know about the risk factors relative to safety on the campus that she was at. So the federal policy response to that was to require higher education institutions to start reporting to start collecting and reporting on crime and to be providing warnings on various crimes on campuses. It has become the primary federal uh, compliance area for campus safety. Every time there is a major safety event at an institution of higher education, you can pretty much know that there will be a Clery Act compliance investigation following that. Whenever there is an investigation or an audit of the Clery Act of a higher education institution, there are almost always fines. Um, and those fines are significant. And the reason there's almost always fines is because it's super complicated to comply with it. There's various elements. We have to do annual security reports. For us, that's an annual security report of every single campus. Um, that is a collection of crime statistics in that. In those statistics, you have to correctly categorize every single crime. So a violation under a Clery Act audit could be that you failed to correctly categorize a specific crime. And each one of those violations at present is, has a $62,000 violation. And that, the, the fees and fines for Clery Act violations go up every year. They're tied to the consumer price index. Over on the right-hand side of all of my slides, I have just sort of broad picture federal information what's happening to other higher education institutions and a little bit of information. And I can talk about those a little bit, but you'll see over there some big fines for various institutions. Um, and those are representative of what is happening now. These, the fines are, are going up pretty significantly. Um, so 
we are required to do an annual security report, required to do publicly available daily crime logs, and we're required to provide timely warnings and emergency notifications of dangerous events. And we're required to do that consistently across our whole system. Um, that, is, that is challenging for a system as broad and diverse as ours, and when we have um, different staff sizes at various campuses. The, uh, audit that Heather did identified uh, three, 10 areas of risk, three high areas of risk, um, and five moderate areas. And I am happy to share that we address those highest risk areas um, immediately. We, one thing you might be wondering is like, well, why, why were these high risk at that point in time? Why hadn't you already addressed those? This audit we knew was coming. We wanted to make sure that Heather had the opportunity to look at the whole system and that we would have her review to guide us and, and frankly, to help elevate Clery Act compliance with the whole system. It's not something that is in any one person's job description, which is one of our challenges. Everybody who does Clery Act compliance right now at WSU, it's an add-on to their already full-time job. Um, so this uh, audit has been uh, extremely helpful. We have not seen the level of commitment to compliance on the Clery Act across all campuses that we are seeing right now. Um, we have already addressed the, the need to have a central compliance committee. That committee has been set up within our compliance structures that will ensure that there is reporting through me and up to you um, on our uh, compliance objectives for the Clery Act. So we have uh, a coordinator, is um, Gary Jenkins, our police chief. And um, all other risk factors uh, are being addressed by the committee. They have, we have a calendar in place. Everything will be begun um, prior to year end. There are certain implementation factors that will not be fully completed until after the end of the year. But, um, that we feel good about. Uh, I will, uh, interestingly enough, I think that uh, some people, um, uh, Don Daniels, our assistant chief of police, just sent an email about just saying, I just went to a national education seminar, learned about minors on campus, which you're going to hear more about, was asking about minors and the Clery Act. And at the very end, she's like, the more I learn, the more I think we really need one person for Clery Act compliance on this institution. But, you know, right now we are doing the best we can um, in the situation that we have. And we've got really good momentum and we feel good about um, addressing the elements in the audit. But I want to be really clear that that audit was about what is our infrastructure for Clery Act compliance. It wasn't looking at the details of our annual security report of the information in our time of warning. So that, that's what would be looked at by the federal government if they come. Um, and we have had one Clery audit previously that we were fine. Um, and uh, I think we had three violations and that fine at that point in time was about half of what the one single fine is for a single violation at this point. It's a different world. And it's um, gaining in, um, I think, uh, importance in terms of federal policy and compliance as well relative to higher education because it's so intrinsically linked with campus safety. That it's all about campus safety. Any questions about that? Um, do they just show up when they do this audit? How does that work? They um, send us a notice basically, and say, we've selected you for a Clery Act review. Um, and the, the, how they go about selecting institutions, uh, it's not completely clear, but it is clear that institutions that have uh, had major events do tend to get selected for review. They, how much notice is that, like a week? Um, Probably they'll send it. I mean, and I'm just thinking about other audits from that we've been involved with federal government. They might give us a month's notice. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not enough time to go. I mean, and and it's looking backward at you know our reports and our notices, and so it's not as if there's an opportunity to make sort of proactive yeah. changes, but just to start to gather information. Basically, usually what they say is, "You're going to be audited. Please gather all your information and have it to us by <clears> the next day." 
Yes. So the uh, shooting that happened at Michigan State University in February of this year, would that trigger something for an audit to come, come through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It probably would. Um, although, you know, Michigan State did, uh, and you'll hear a little bit about this event too, but uh, the Larry Nasser stuff at Michigan State University, that triggered an audit. And in fact, their fine was about four and a half million dollars for um, that, amongst all their other settlement numbers, but that was one element of the cost of that. So and I can yes. add to the Michigan State issue with the recent shooting they've taken the step of bringing in their own outside party to do an evaluation of that. And it's like the federal government will then wait for that to be done so they can use that in their investigation. Do you recall what the uh, infraction was that happened to us a number of years ago where the fine was much smaller than it would be today, but what those fines were about? They were, um, I think, so there were three violations um, I think two where we failed to correctly categorize specific crimes in our annual security report. So, I mean, it's like that very detailed things. And I can't remember what the third one is, but Danielle might remember. Yeah, it was a report of a sexual assault that someone improperly unfounded. Right. Um, and uh, it was it was a very technical violation, yeah. frankly. So is there training then for, you say that everyone is involved and it's part of their added yeah. responsibilities what kind of training do people go through or we're does, just yeah. implementing that um we just signed up for the national training program um for we now have a, a clery committee we have representation on that committee from every single campus um and uh they're all going to be provided with the training and that's an annual subscription that we'll be looking at because that's exactly the case it is is extremely complicated to comply um, and uh, making sure that we have training in place for everyone who's involved is pretty significant. Part of the Cleary issue too is there's the one big element of Cleary is Cleary geography and that's that how does the Cleary Act apply to various geographies of a system? So for us, it actually applies to all of our research and extension centers. Um, as you can imagine, that gets pretty complicated. Uh, we have to look at the crime statistics for every single geography that we have. Um, we have activity on, you know, we have programs on in Bremerton and, and that of course Everett and Mount Vernon um, and Lynn, um, which is probably the easiest one maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it's complicated. Yes, Laura. You just answered one of my questions because I was going to ask about extension and mm -hmm. how far the reach is. How are how are how do they define like a campus? I mean, it does it do you have like on the geography? Because a lot of times campuses are sort of embedded in a community. Mm -hmm. And so they do have certain um, outlines, I guess, of land that we own. And would that be if, but how about lease sites and that type of thing? I, I can tell you that, that this is a really highly debated definition. There have been times when the Department of Education says that the geography and the areas you have to report on extend to hotels that your students go to year in, year out. Um, one of the big issues, uh, all of our um, uh, global studies, study abroad, do does every single international location is that part of clearing geography and do we have to report crime statistics for every single international like Africa. location and i can you know that is um if you think it's hard to get crime statistics in this country try trying to get the crime statistics in international locations so it's it's not settled um and different institutions interpret it differently um, we have tended to interpret it um, less broadly, uh, in part, you know, due to our capacity to address the compliance requirements. Huge. Any other comments or questions for Cheryl or Cleary? That's Cleary. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's really uh, you know important to know about, but I, I think it's also just so important to know that 
it, it is out there for campus safety. And, when, and we do have statistics for campus safety. And in fact, our statistics for campus safety are pretty good. So it is in our interest to get that information. OK, from, from Cleary to Title IX compliance. Title IX compliance is almost always in the news. Um, it, Title IX compliance, we used to, prior to 2011, primarily think of it in terms of athletics and Title IX compliance and athletic programs and intercollegiate um, programs. Um, in 2011, the uh, Obama administration issued a Dear Colleague letter that said Title IX applies to um, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination across the whole delivery of education, so across the whole campus. And in fact, there's process elements that every single higher education institution has to comply with. And that was, um, when that came out, I think it took a lot of us a lot of time to get our head around what they were actually saying and how big it was. Um, and it was a game changer uh, for higher education. And we've been responding to it ever since. Um, it required um, a significant overlay of process. Uh, in, and since then, it has become politicized. The process around sexual harassment and sexual discrimination in higher education. Um, the Obama administration opened that up. Um, and in, in, in some terminology, um, what was viewed as very favorable to victims' rights. The Trump administration came in and said that process uh, has um, disadvantaged respondents. Um, and in the name of due process, we are going to add additional requirements that uh, people on the victim's rights set side would say made it harder for victims. The Biden administration uh, predictably has come back in and is saying, we are now changing those rules again. What all of that means is those rule changes about process are enormous and they require all of us uh, to change our rules and to change our process. And so that's what our staff has to, you know, that takes at least several months for staff in multiple offices to respond to every single process change. And it also creates additional risk and exposure after the fact because um, respondents and um, complainants will say, well, you know, I didn't get the process I was entitled to under this version of the rule. So that is, that is the world of Title IX on the process side. We know there are new rules coming out um, from Title IX uh, process this summer. We thought it was going to be May. I just heard an update that it probably isn't going to be May. When it does, it will take staff from uh, HRS, from the Dean of Students, from across Student Affairs, from CCR, from the Provost Office, because it applies to the process for all employees um, and all uh, students um, in terms of sexual addressing sexual harassment and sexual discrimination. These new rules are going to expand the definition of what discrimination is. They're going to add reporting obligations and response obligations and additional training obligations. The good news is, is that we've been pretty proactive in this space. And so, for example, um, thank you very much for when we uh, moved up our EP15 training to an annual training. So we're, we're ahead of the game there. Um, we're ahead of the game in responding uh, to um, pregnancy discrimination issues as being a big issue in these new rules. And so we're ahead of the game there as well. Um, in terms of just thinking about what that means for us, in addition to taking people away from responding to complaints um, and, and, and taking time to address uh, the, the rule changes, it's helpful to know sort of what is the status of our complaints. Uh, in 2021, CCR had 390 um, reports that came in. In 2022, they had 737. And this year, in the first quarter, they've had 275. We're on track to be at a thousand complaints this year. We are not, you know, that's not additional investigators. In fact, we're down half an, an investigator and will the investigator's time will be taken away to create this new process. So that's, that's what this means in real time. It means that it's um, more difficult for us to timely respond uh, to complaints and to address the civil rights of the individuals who are bringing forward issues. Uh, I think in my last report to you, I had uh, shown some information that, that we had 
significantly improved our response time to reports that we cut that time in half. But I don't know that that is the case at this point in time, given our uh, static and actual loss of an investigator, the process time, uh, the time we're going to have to take on this process and the increased number of reports. Any um, indication of why the increase in reports? Well, it's interesting. There's um, some thought that this generation of students is uh, more willing to come forward and to report on issues. Uh, and that they are seeing that by group, by coming forward and reporting that there's actually, um, there's a response um, and that those issues will be addressed. We like to think that that's, um, I don't know if it's fair to think that there are more incidents. That's a really, really hard thing because we all know that um, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination has been significantly underreported historically. So it's very hard to, to know. Do we know how we are trending relative to other institutions? Haven't looked at that. We can look at that. Yeah, we should, yeah. We should benchmark for ourselves yeah. relative to others. In terms of yeah, increase in reports. Yeah, typically what you'll see is you know us against our relative mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. We'll take a look at that. This is just a, a bottom-up suggestion. The statistics you had on the previous slide about the level the fines have gotten to, it would be great to get those in your EP15 training in near the beginning. Oh, <laughs> on, 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 on Cleary Act funds, yeah. Well, for the Not whole, any, yeah. anything yeah. around EP15, for, for the people doing the training to mm -hmm. realize that the risk, there's risk around what happens to people if we're not doing this right, to our students, to our faculty, to our colleagues. Mm -hmm. I think we understand that how important this is for our community. But I think faculty and staff also need to realize the risk to the university from a financial perspective of not being on track by these things. But it's not just about whether or not I think it's important to report. It is about what, what could happen to the institutions. Yeah. I, think, I think that will grab some attention that might not otherwise be grabbed. Right, it will, and, and I mean, every, Almost every single investigation of CCR that finds a violation creates risk exposure for the institution, usually it's us. And it's not just financial, it's reputational. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's good advice. And we, we are always updating that training. Um, and in fact, one thing we're going to do because it's now annual is uh, try to create refresher trainings that sort of, you know, that will we'll get the base level training and then we'll have emphasis in training. Yeah, and so then this is on what's new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or certain areas because it's complex area it is. too. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. I mean, it's, mu it's much appreciated the work that CCR, CCS, HRS, the, the support we're getting to build a good healthy community around some of these ideas is much appreciated. Other comments or questions for Cheryl? Okay. okay, so that's the two big uh, compliance areas. Those are, um, we spend a lot of time in that space. Um, risk management areas I wanna focus on is minors. One thing when you think about higher education, don't always think about minors, but we have minors everywhere on campus. And every day I learn about new areas where we have minors. It really is amazing to me. I think I, I, I think I can safely say that we probably have at least 500 employees who provide programming to minors in some way, shape, or form. That may, it, some of them are just all minors. Some may do some things for minors and some things for um, our more traditional student education. So we have never had as an institution a policy um, with respect to um, programming for minors and setting a baseline for training, for um, what, registering your program and um, making sure that there is knowledge about the program for background checks um, and for making sure that there's awareness about mandated reporting. Those are the four elements that are the best, um, you know, uh, best practices for minors. Our policy goes beyond that. It sets uh, standards and expectations for interacting with minors um, and for responding to behavior from minors as well. 
So we're very excited to have this policy out there. It's in review. It will be finalized over the summer. We will implement it um, over a period of time to give programs an opportunity to train their employees, to participate in the training, to learn about the program, um, and to come into compliance with the new policy. Uh, there, um, when you think about the really high profile issues in higher education that get um, splashed across the news in this country, usually when they involve big settlements, there's, the, there's minors involved there. There's um, mistreatment of minors underlying those programs. Uh, and so having, having a policy like this is, is a critical step to meeting best practices and to ensuring that we um, are doing everything we can for the safety of minors on our campuses. So some programs uh, that we have that, you know, 4-H, right? You think about 4-H, I mean, that's everywhere. And, um, and so land grants have a particular duty in care for minors. Um, we also have Gear Up programs, the, the TRIO programs, Gear Up and Outward Bound are two that are uh, relatively well known that they have individuals in the in, in embedded in high schools uh, around the state who do so just a couple of examples I learned um, just the other day we have a, a clinic on on campus that is um, providing some specific care to minors and so it's just it, it's all over um, and so we're very um, pleased it's taken years to get to this point it's a, it's a long policy it's not perfect we're going to get it out there. We're going to start to implement it. We're going to learn about how we need to change it. We're going to start to set some expectations for treatment for minors. Would Cleary fall into this category too for any corrections in this area? Yeah, um, certainly, yeah. Um, and reporting obligations. Uh, uh, that's that was the specific training that our assistant police chief had gone to. The overlay of minors and Cleary. Um, and she's like, oh my gosh, there's so much here that we need to be addressing. And luckily we were able to say, exactly, you were right. And here's, we, we're doing a lot of what she was asking for. Um, and, and how big is your team? I mean, <clears throat> how big is the, um, for instance, on the Title IX, how many investigators do you have? We have um, for a thousand that we may experience. Yeah, this we have three and a half investigators. We've had to take one investigator um, and also and take cut his position to half time so that we we also have ethics compliance advising, and we had to share that position for um, a part investigator and part ethics compliance advising due to budget issues. So um, that's what we have. It is difficult to keep people in these positions. And um, we have uh, colleagues around the state at other higher education institutions whose salaries are better than ours are um, for these positions. So it's, it's very challenging. We, we have a fabulous group and that keeps a lot of really great employees. Um, so we feel very lucky, and I feel very lucky for the team I have, but it's, and it's hard work. Could we uh, talk briefly, um, the couple of some of the facts on the right hand side, um, I, I think it's hard not to have heard in the news about Michigan State University. Um, could you just share a little about, you know, obviously the risk management about university programs involving minors is significant, certainly from the impact to minors. From a university governing board standpoint, could you perhaps just give us a little bit of insight in terms of um, the risk, maybe financially, um, that yeah. you've seen in terms of um, if we're not paying attention to this or if the university finds themselves in trouble relative to this kind of program, what sorts of um, risks have maybe other universities faced financially? Well, um, you know, I, I'll share the Michigan State one just so you all know because it's such a uh, um, eye-popping number. 
uh, I do feel good to say that, you know, I, I work a lot both with our health services group and with our athletics group um, and, and feel like the situations that arose there, we have standards in place to make sure those situations won't be here. But the Michigan State Settlement's 37% of the institution's budget is $500 million. Um, that's a game changer. Before that, the big one was um, Pennsylvania State, and that was two, that we thought that was huge. That was $250,000, and that was uh, issues involving minors as well in the area of athletics. $250,000? I'm sorry, $250 million. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, a, a typical case with a minor, if you have something that arises, it creates enormous risk uh, because one, the period of time for which claims can come forward is extended until they get to the age of majority and then you don't learn about it until after the fact. So there is, that's, a, that's an enormous issue. Um, and then uh, it, it, it compounds typically depending on the scale of damages because um, it's, it, their, their whole life's ahead of them. Um, and they're very sad and difficult pieces to work through. Certainly the impact is sad. Yeah, it is. Um, and, you know, we, the cases we've had involving minors have been more about, an, you know, one-off injury incident, but even those were, were big cases because of all of those factors that are associated with minors. Well, just looking at your overall enterprise risk management chart, which, as you know, I'm a huge fan of looking at enterprise risk management from, you know, both it's, it's turning it on its head and looking at opportunities as well as risk. And, you know, we later on in today's discussion, we'll talk a lot about enrollment and you emphasize enrollment and, and dependence on tuition as risk factors, not only for us, but for higher ed in general. Um, when I think about uh, Clery Act and Title IX and risk to minors and um, and not only financial risk but more importantly reputational risk, which is you know talk about priceless, right? That's um, both reputational risk but also the the, the uh, value of a great reputation, uh, those and a, a great brand. Um, I. It, we we need to invest more in the things that, that we're talking about now uh, to, to make sure that we don't disaster strike and meteors strike and you can't you know risk manage your way out of every disaster and, and bad things do happen to good people who are trying very hard. Um, but I feel that um, some of the stuff that you are working your way through deserve some more investment. So I would I would like to encourage us to, to try to put some more dollars into some of these areas just because we have had some meteors strike us um, from a reputational standpoint and we need to invest everything we can obviously in the proactive marketing that we're doing but also in preventing some things that could damage us reputationally um, that don't need to. Uh, and, and a Clery Act violation, which may be highly technical, which it sounds like some of the things in the past have been, still is a big headline um, that, that you just don't need to have. Um, and obviously something that might actually harm somebody would just be terrible for the individual, but, but also for us from a petitional standpoint. Thanks. I'm particularly committed to doing everything we can here, but resources are a real issue. Question about the, how is minor child defined? Because I could imagine that we have a certain cadre of students who are minors when they, when they matriculate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially if you get some that are a little on the young side, you know, coming, coming through. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, do, how does it, I mean, It'd be pretty hard to do background checks on everybody. You know, have to do it on the whole campus. You're correct. Um, and the the definition of a minor is um, it, it, maybe situational isn't the best way to say that. But depending on how you're looking 
um, at the interaction of the individual. In our policy, we do um, provide an exception to not the definition of a minor, but to the application of the policy to um, regularly enrolled students because that is so broad. Um, and so that's, you know, what we're talking about are not our regularly enrolled students. There's a whole set of policies and a whole infrastructure in place for them. What we're talking about are the high school students who are coming um, for summer camp um, and the individuals who are working with high school students out in the year of an outward bound program. So, um, in, you know, in the law, there is, it, it's age-based and for, in terms of statute, you know, we statute of limitations and various claims, then that definition is age-based, but um, for application of our policy, uh, we're focusing we tried to make sure it didn't uh, unnecessarily impede and or conflict with what is in place for our enrolled students. Otherwise it'd be a nightmare. Right, right. And that's consistent with other higher education institutions. Oh, I'm a huge fan of ERM as well. Um, and it's a layer of protection to be proactive. I'm curious, how does uh, the Michigan state with 37% of the budget being hit managed through that. Is there an insurance infrastructure? And what, you know, how do you prepare for that kind of thing? Um, I don't know. Yes, we have an insurance infrastructure. That impact is so huge that it's impacting the whole state. So I, I, I don't know how you prepare for that, quite frankly. Um, but for us, our insurance infrastructure in this state, we are, it's a state funded insurance liability program. Um, and so we work with um, uh, Department of Enterprise Services, which is the insurance company, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, and they are our partners. Uh, we, um, I'm talking with them most days um, for all of our claims and um, uh, we work together with the AGO on every single claim that comes forward. So we are, we have a, it's, it's a very good program. It is uh, also, we, we are in a state that doesn't have tort caps, which is a significant issue. But these splashy events that happen, in fact, impact everybody's insurance premiums. So insurance premiums for general liability across higher ed are going up by 50 and 100 percent of the time. So, uh, and the caps are coming down because they're they're going to cap you out at some point. And everything above that, you're responsible for. So, that's important for us to understand. That. Right. Our um our premiums for our liability program, which are through our state budget, gets funded. One first thing to get funded in our state budget. <laughs> They triple um, um, so this this is a just a, a specific incident I wanted to report out on um, it was a cybersecurity risk risk incident that we have been managing through since um, February with our uh, information um, security group and our whole IT group. We have intrusions every day, every week, but we don't have incidents that are of this magnitude every day and every week. And part of the reason I wanted to report out to you all was to um, not only make you aware of the fact that higher education is a target for ransomware, um, that we are in a distributed environment, which, which I think ransomware um, companies, I don't know what you call them, um, <laughs> have started to focus on. Yeah, and, uh, and we're doing, uh, our information security group is very actively um, looking and learning from this incident. And we were, it was a silver lining incident for us, but it was very close. Um, so there's a lot to learn from this one. We had to bring in an outside forensic firm to confirm our determination that there had not been a data breach um, due to the difficulty in reaching that decision. And that's one of the reasons and one of the ways in which we're looking at making improvements to our systems. 
um, that should allow us to have better laws and make it easier for us to make those determinations. Um, we have a corrective action plan. It's a tiered corrective action plan. It's got four tiers in it, and each tier has about anywhere from three to five or six steps. So we'll be involving many institutions or many units across the whole system because the information under, underlying this incident was across the whole institution as well. Um, and uh, it is uh, a when you when we look at ERM, it's a high risk for us. It's a high risk in higher education. And uh, you might have heard the collective sigh when we got the final conclusion because it was an enormous sigh. It, um, you know, was something that the, the response would have been a would have been a multi million dollar response um, given the scale and scope of this. And we don't have cyber risk insurance at this point in time because the market closed off the higher ed uh, in a very real way in the past year. Um, we are going to be going back out to the market to look at it uh, once we have taken at least the initial tier of corrective actions um, and feel that we can better respond to the really detailed applications that are starting to come in for cyber risk insurance. Um, yeah, and so real quick on ERM updates, we're in progress. Um, on on um, updating just the 20 top risks from last year and any new risks that um, any of our risk owners are identifying. Um, I will get the um, updated report out to you as soon as we finish scoring. Uh, we have just a couple of more risk owners to work with to get uh, updated reports, and then we will start scoring next week. Um, scoring will be across uh, risk owners, across the risk management executive committee and leadership groups. Um, so uh, uh, we, ex uh, you know, I don't expect uh, that there will be substantial changes to what's on the list, but the order of those may change. And it's interesting to see United Educators is the largest underwriter for higher education. Um, their list of the top risks for higher education, top 10, are pretty consistent with um, what we saw on our list last year and probably what we'll see on our list this year. So that's, I had hoped, um, but what we, what we did instead uh, in terms of timing was we went back and actually uh, wrote, updated our risk management policy so that we got ERM into policy rather than jumping into the actual implementing, we jumped into the implementation of the software and, and, and getting the program up and running, but we really needed the policy to underlie that and put into policy what we had been discussing with everybody. So we did, that policy will be finalized in the next couple of weeks as well. Um, and uh, we'll be good to go and we'll be working to get this out sooner uh, in subsequent years and, and really working with Chris Hoyt's group uh, to overlay her planning calendar and also with the um, budget plan so that our risks can, we, our leadership can know our risks when they're thinking about budget planning um, and about strategic goals and priorities. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the item that says diversity, equity, inclusion, can you remind what this is? That um, th that's the whole risk in terms of our 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 system response to issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and one of the reasons it's a risk, I think, is in terms of kind of defining exactly what does that mean and where does that lie. Um, what are we, we're doing a lot in that area, but, but picking up what we're doing in various different units and providing um, sort of a, a cohesive look at that is, is a particular risk. Uh, another particular risk is just making sure that we are aware of those issues. And um, I mean, you've heard Provost Chilton talk about all the efforts that they're making on the academic side. Um, and there are efforts going on in student affairs and in, this, in every single unit. And just, um, keeping that um, on the top of our higher risk, recognizing the role it plays in higher education and in society.
wonder if um, this is maybe thank you. I just wonder if the framing of that <coughs> as um, sort of um, I don't know monitoring of or you know, the, the support system to rolling out of programs related to DEI might be just because it would it just sort of struck me odd. No, I appreciate that. I, I think um, it's actually a comment that as we've worked on this, so this is the last year was the first year we implemented this ERM program and actually naming risks is a really big deal and we talk about it a lot with risk partners um, and we've made adjustments over it uh, over time because you're right. It does, it does make a difference. Definitely take that. Because I'm not, I'm not the risk owner here. Each of these risks has a separate risk owner. I'm just sort of like the person the who bugs everybody. <laughs> You're the <laughs> aggregator. I'm the one like knocking on everyone's door, basically. Any other? Sorry, I just want to follow up. Regent Shelton, is your comment, um, because words matter, the suggestion of renaming what those words are so that they are more reflective of what the risk is? Yeah, thank you for yeah, just reflecting that. Just so, the idea that DEI is a risk when in fact it is a solution. Thank you. So we want it here. We agree with you. And is there another way that we could reframe that so that it isn't uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is the risk, instead it's the solution? And how are we tracking how we're more, um, how we are advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in a more progressive way? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. You know, sometimes compliance is pretty heavy, right? Um, and the Rubik's Cube is just a great illustration. There's um, also an approach to have opportunities on a Rubik's Cube, right? Risk issues and opportunities. And I'm just curious um, have we started to exercise that discussion? Maybe we can talk about it later in the finance side um, in terms of a parallel Rubik's Cube. I like that. Mm -hmm. I know. do too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I Happy Cube. Want to Happy there. Cube. Well, yeah. <laughs> sure. What a balanced cube. <laughs> right. Right. I, I agree completely. Because there's a lot of risk in not exercising, not recognizing and our opportunities and strategically um, addressing them. I'm sure you'll get that. Uh, <laughs> for reference to this. I'm group. looking at Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we do talk a lot about that because it is, it, 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 they go hand in hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Both very much. Really appreciate it. Very fulsome report. A lot uh, to, to cover and digest. And thank you for all the work that you've done and uh, thank you. continue to do for us. Thank much everyone. appreciated. Thank you. I, and I welcome any questions. I'm around all day if anybody wants additional information. But thanks for all your input, too, and your support. Thank you. So that concludes the Strategic and Operational Excellence Committee meeting. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to our chair, Mr. Um, uh, at this time, the regents will adjourn and break for lunch, and uh, the regents will return at 1 p.m. for the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close.